About 78% of Americans right now are either overweight or obese. Ketogenesis is the creation of ketones. You produce ketones when you metabolize. Dr. David Harper, cancer researcher. The ketones are a byproduct that have uh, many therapeutic benefits in and of themselves, but it's also a molecule that can be burned as a fuel. But people need to realize this is the, a natural human state. As most people have been eating high carbohydrate diets, that's what we've been recommending for decades in you know our policymakers, and a low fat, high carbohydrate diet, which by the way, never had any robust science behind it. So you just need to swap out the potatoes, rice, pasta, bread, um, and then you're adding in more. Most chronic disease is kind of self-inflicted. So when we're talking about chronic disease, we're talking about uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's. It's virtually impossible to prove scientifically. However, if you look at what we've been recommending in the West since the 1980s, since the first US dietary guidelines, which is this high carbohydrate diet, low fat diet, and you can just look at all the numbers, the, the increase in obesity, the increase in insulin resistance, the increase in inflammation, the increase in cardiovascular disease, increase in cancer. Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. I like to talk health, well-being and self-improvement every Monday and Thursday, where I'm joined by some of the world's leading experts from the health, wellness and self-improvement world. So if that is your thing, well, then please do like subscribe because it's free and it takes two seconds. Uh, share with other people who you think might get value and uh, education from tuning in and do leave the podcast a positive rating, as many of you have already done to date. I think we're at about four and a half, almost five stars out of five, which is absolutely fantastic. And a reminder, we are now on Instagram and on YouTube if you want to check out the videos of these episodes. And Spotify are allowing podcasters like myself to put the videos of their episodes on the Spotify platform. So if you want to check out the videos there, you are free to do so. Now, today I am joined by Dr. David Harper. He is a health educator and cancer researcher and author of BioDiet. We talk about ketogenesis. We ask what it is and what the ketogenic diet actually looks like. We hear about the axis of illness and the role carbohydrates play when adopting the ketogenic way of life. Dr. Harper discusses the impact modern diets have on chronic inflammation and their contribution to metabolic disease. Expect to hear about insulin resistance and what role it plays in our becoming unwell. Explore why evolving scientific research that is performed to the highest of standards is key to achieving optimum health. We also talk about the role food companies play in influencing not only our diets for the worse, but also food policy in the Western world. Plus, we hear about Dr. Harper's latest study where he looks at the impact a ketogenic diet had on women with breast cancer. This is a really interesting discussion. I hope you enjoy. Now, let's start by talking about ketogenesis and the ketogenic diet. Now, for people who aren't sure about what this term means or these terms mean, what exactly is ketogenesis? And then uh, we can talk then about what the ketogenic diet looks like. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the notion of ketogenesis is genesis, you know, literally means creation of. Uh, so it's the creation of ketones and, and you produce ketones when you metabolize uh, fats in the body. And uh, the ketones are a byproduct um, that have uh, many therapeutic benefits in and of themselves, but it's also a molecule that can be burned as a fuel uh, quite efficiently. Um, and that uh, ketogenesis occurs mostly in the liver, but also in the kidneys. The kidneys contribute as well. And uh, we're, it's a natural state. Uh, we're, we're in a state of, uh, of, of ketosis or uh, what we call nutritional ketosis in the, uh, in the evenings when we're asleep, we, we produce ketones in the night. Uh, we produce ketones when we're a baby in the womb and we continue to produce ketones uh, and, and are in a state of nutritional ketosis uh, as infants as long as we're breastfeeding. So I think one of the things is that people need to realize this is the, a natural human state. And, and the way you sort of get there 
is by restricting carbohydrate in the diet. So, so in terms of the dietary sense, the macronutrients, which are the proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, uh, you eliminate uh, almost all of the carbohydrates or as low as possible. And, and there are no essential carbohydrates, so you're not missing any nutrients. Uh, in fact, you're getting more nutrients because the things you're eating have more fat and they tend to be more nutrient dense. Um, and uh, so so the actual clinical state of nutritional ketosis is more than uh, 0.5 millimoles per milliliter. Um, and in our clinical studies, we like to keep the people in a range of 0.5 to 2. Uh, some people can exceed that. And I'll just add one more thing. When many physicians hear this, they think of ketoacidosis which is an extremely high level of ketones. It's a byproduct of, of um, untreated diabetes uh, and, and, and the sugar metabolism, uh, it, it, un, unable to metabolize sugar. So the ketone levels get very, this is like a tenfold increase. So that is an unhealthy state. It creates a state of acidosis, which is potentially life-threatening. But that's a very different thing from nutritional ketosis, which is our normal human state. So essentially, then ketogenesis is then about the restriction, as you said, of carbohydrates. That's how you get there. Yeah. OK. And then how how soon then, for example, if let's say on a Monday morning, I start to restrict carbohydrates, how soon can I get to that optimum level of ketogenesis that we're talking about? That's an excellent question, Matthew, actually. Um, uh, so, so when we're talking about carbohydrates, uh, we're talking about there's really, you know, three forms. There's, there's sugars, uh, which taste sweet. Uh, there are the polymerized forms of sugars, which are starch or glycogen. Uh, and then there's fiber um, in the diet, too. And so you, the fiber doesn't really enter into the picture because it's not metabolized in the same way. So uh, you're really restricting starch and, and sugars in the diet. That's what we're reducing. And when you do that, um, it, it takes a couple of weeks for most people to adapt to develop that state of nutritional ketosis, where they're producing ketones at a regular level. Um, because most people have been eating high carbohydrate diets. That's what we've been recommending for decades in you know our policymakers, and a low fat, high carbohydrate diet, which by the way never had any robust science behind it, but. It seemed like a, the right thing to do at the time. It's just really lousy science. And I actually taught that too. So the first thing I do in my book is apologize for teaching the wrong stuff and not check, checking the primary science. Um, so yeah, it takes a couple of weeks. And I think I have a guitar in the background, which I, I play terribly. But um, when you start playing guitar, you know uh, you don't have the calluses on your fingers from, from fretting. But over a period of weeks, you'll develop those because you're stimulating the production of protein, keratin. So the enzymes that you require to produce and metabolize ketones take a while to get going. And so for most people, it's a, a couple of weeks, typically. And then and then you'll reach that state of, of nutritional ketosis, and then you can maintain that as long as you'd like. Okay, so what then are the benefits that are conferred upon healthy individuals if they ascribe to this ketogenic diet? I, I want to talk about healthy individuals, first of all. Sure. Um, well, there's there's uh, two ways we approach this. What what we believe is that you know a ketogenic diet is a natural human diet. It's how we evolved. You know, there's no cornflakes and bagels and potatoes around. Uh, you know, as we evolved as as a human species. So going back to that natural state um, um, does take uh, some 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 time and some effort. And uh, what you need to do is really. Um, establish new habits. So I love the the name of your show. It's just establish new habits. Most people eat kind of the same meals. You know, Fridays is whatever day, and Saturdays is whatever day. So so you just need to swap out the potatoes, rice, pasta, bread, that sort of thing. Um, and then you're adding in more fat because there's only three macronutrients: fats, uh, lipids, or fats, and then carbohydrates and proteins. And probably 25 to 35 percent is the maximum protein so so then you're swapping out this high carbohydrate diet and, and swapping in good fats and that includes saturated fats by the way there, there's never been any evidence to suggest that that saturated fats any good evidence there's been lots of suggestion but it's never been demonstrated that saturated fats relate to cardiovascular disease cardiovascular disease is an inflammatory condition which actually relates more to high sugar consumption than than fats at all I'm not sure if that answered your question exactly, but it seemed like the, uh, uh, the, the way to go. I think people that are interested in adopting a ketogenic diet uh, need to understand that it's not a short-term calorie-restricted diet. 
Um, it, it's intended to be a lifestyle change, so you need to develop these new eating habits. Um, and when you do, if you're a if you're a healthy individual, what it will help you do is maintain that optimal health, maintain that that level of um, good metabolic health. Maybe we want to define that, and and that will help prevent chronic disease because uh, most chronic disease is kind of self-inflicted. So when we're talking about chronic disease, we're talking about uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, some others, uh, and they tend to be self-inflicted due to lifestyle. And, and by far the most important lifestyle element, uh, the most important lifestyle choice you make every day is what's on the end of your fork. Food has more impact on your overall health than, than alcohol, than drug abuse, than sedentary behavior, lack of exercise, all combined. That was a, a 2017 study in, in Lancet. So it's, so it's really important whether you are healthy now or not. And you talk about a healthy person, you know, we, what we want to do is keep that, that health span uh, carrying on as long as possible. Uh, we're not really thinking about lifespan. Um, it's more staying as healthy as you can because right now with all these sexy interventions, we can take people that are quite unhealthy in middle age and keep them alive for 30 more years, but it's not very high quality of life. They're not healthy individuals. So if you look at the United States, for example, because we have good data from them, I think it's probably similar in 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 Ireland and in in um, in Europe, but about 78% of Americans right now are either overweight or obese. So that already defines them as unhealthy metabolically if they're overweight or obese. Now there'll be other factors that add into that, which is like blood pressure and blood lipids and blood sugar and so on. But but most of the population is already unhealthy. They may not have realized the consequences of that unhealthy lifestyle because those things tend to build up over a period of like a decade or two decades. And then you start to see these chronic diseases appear. And to me, they're all uh, they're all a, a product of the same root cause, which is poor metabolic health. And they manifest as diabetes or they manifest as heart disease or cancer. And all of those, you know, tend to be uh, comorbidities. So they they all happen together. And you kind of feel like your body's falling apart because you're suddenly all these things are getting out of whack. The great news about that is what, what, what we, we found, especially working with diabetic patients, type 2 diabetes, um, is that uh, even some that are taking like 100 units of insulin a day, they can reverse that poor metabolic health in as little as like six weeks. And, and it really does return your body to that natural state of health. I really like the term health span. I spoke with uh, an anti-aging specialist, Dr. Mm -hmm. Matt Caberline there a few months ago, and he spoke at length about uh, health span. And uh, I, I think it's really, it's entered the zeitgeist in, in recent times. I think people are appreciating exactly what health span means. We're used to hearing, as you said, the term lifespan, but health span as we live longer is actually more important than lifespan. Sure. And I, I mean, there's 8 billion of us. We don't really want us all to be living longer. That's not going to be good for the, for the planet. You want to talk about sustainability. But, you know, ideally what happens is you live a long and healthy life. You're very active and, and alert and with it. And you have two bad weeks and it's all over. That's kind of what we what what we would hope for is a long health span um, rather than hitting your 50s and then having this slow decline of your health and 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 more and more interventions and more and more drugs and more and more you know, assist to keep a low quality of life. So, and 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 for most people, they can do it. I think a lot of people, as they reach middle age, which I'm at, um, they they kind of they, they kind of just give up and say that's just a part of aging. You get overweight and your blood sugar goes up and your blood. It doesn't have to happen that way. Uh, it is happening because of years of chronic um, poor diet. I would argue, um, and you can reverse much of those effects quite rapidly if you just return to a, a natural human diet, a healthy diet, which we. We call a well-formulated ketogenic diet. That's the clinical term we use, uh, uh, coined by Dr. Stephen Finney. And that's, um, it means well-formulated means it, it has all of the nutrients that you need, all of the vitamins, minerals, and all the the fuel that you need. So that's a well-formulated ketogenic diet. It's, a, it's, a, it's also, you could call it a balanced diet. I love that notion that we don't have to accept the status quo, that we can actually take control of our health and uh, move it in a positive direction. We can come to the benefits of the ketogenic diet for chronically ill patients in a second, but it just occurred to me that we're talking about the ketogenic diet, which involves, as you said, extracting or removing 
carbohydrates from the diet and focusing then on the consumption of protein and as you said fats which is crucial this kind of sounds like well it certainly will to some people it'll sound like a paleo diet or a carnivore based diet can we make the distinction between a paleo diet for example and the ketogenic diet or are they one and the same uh the the principle of the paleo diet is to eat what the caveman ate um, and but it's an art, it, you know, what cavemen actually ate is 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 to be debated. But we do know that um, you know one of the most important nutrients that we need is is iron actually, as a as a mineral. And and in the natural environment, you know, it's really hard to get sufficient iron from plant based sources. So uh, so it, it's very likely that the diet of, you know, if we look at the Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, our species, you know, it's been around for a few hundred thousand years. Uh, we ate a ketogenic diet up till about 10,000 years ago when we discovered agriculture and started eating grains and things. Before that, the, the, we would eat some berries and some vegetable matter and nuts and things as well. But the primary source of the fuel was was animal products, and that would contain saturated fat. And But it's very nutrient dense, too. I teach nutrition science, and I'm always ask my students, you know, what's the best source of like vitamins and minerals? And they go, well, it's got to be like leafy greens. And I go, no, no, it's like liver. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and if you, you look at in Canada here, uh, Inuit people in the north, they ate almost entirely animal based diets for millennia, like 10 or 20 millennia. Um, and, and a very high saturated fat level up to 90% saturated fat are, and on that diet are totally healthy. They don't get chronic disease. They don't get diabetes or cardiovascular disease or cancer. Uh, it's only when they start eating the crappy food we send them from the south that's all you know processed food that's high carb high sugar stuff that uh, that they run into trouble so um so it is kind of um i think it's really important to uh when you're establishing these new habits to 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 really understand what the diet does that's why in, in my book bio diet i spend the first half explaining people how nutrition works how the diet works how your digestive system works and what happens when you add too much sugar, too much carbohydrate to your diet and how that does lead to, to chronic disease. I talk about a, a triangle <clears throat> that I call the axis of illness, uh, which includes obesity and inflammation and insulin resistance. And, and if you look up, you can just Google, you know, what, how much chronic disease is due to obesity, how much is due to insulin resistance or, or inflammation. It'll be about 70%. That number just keeps coming up. So, so my back of the envelope argument is, well, if those three things are the root cause of most chronic disease, What's what's causing so much of this chronic disease? And, and it is high carbohydrate diets. They aggravate all three of those. They make people obese. They make people inflamed, uh, and they create insulin resistance, which is which means the insulin uh, molecule is not able to to do what it's designed to do within the body. So you need to secrete more of it as you become resistant to it, and that creates its own problems. So uh, the good news there is, if you pull the carbohydrate out, all those things they they kind of feed on each other. In a, in a positive feedback loop if you're eating carbohydrate, but if you take it out, it goes the other way. They all, the, the obesity goes down, uh, the inflammation goes down. We can measure that through C-reactive protein or similar molecules we can measure in the blood. The, the uh, insulin resistance goes down. We can measure that through a number called HOMA-IR, which is the uh, homeostatic uh, model assessment, they call it, which and we can see that. So, so we've known now for, oh, well, actually we've been using ketogenic diets therapeutically specifically for insulin, or sorry, for epilepsy for over 100 years. But it's really only since the turn of the last century, last 20 years, that we've been experimenting with it and learning about all the therapeutic benefits uh, uh, from ketogenic diets. And we do that by taking people that have chronic disease, putting them on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and then measuring the changes that occur after that. So I do want to be clear about a couple of things. First, I'm not a physician. So, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm a, I'm a nutrition scientist. And secondly, a ketogenic diet is not a cure for cancer or anything like that. Uh, it is a, it's returning yourself to a natural human diet that, that must be done with physicians uh, oversight. Because if you're taking drugs for high blood sugar or high blood pressure, you, you'll need to have a concomitant reduction of those as you adopt a ketogenic diet. So it is important that you consult with your physician. Now, your physician might have no idea what a ketogenic diet is. <laughs> that, that's my that's my chore is to try and re-educate that whole that whole population of of health uh, providers that don't really understand what a ketogenic diet is, and the 20 years of robust research that we have behind us to demonstrate uh, if its efficacy. The other the other thing I want to mention is 
it's it's virtually impossible to prove scientifically that this diet will prevent disease. The reason for that, Matthew, is we'd have to do like a like a drug trial, like a clinical trial. And in, in the third step, what we'd have to do is get thousands of people and put them in two groups, one of which eat the we call the standard American diet, the SAD diet, I'm Canadian, but we still use that term, uh, and, and put others on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Because people are really crappy at understanding what they're eating, you, you'd actually have to give them all their food. And you'd have to do that for decades and then measure the rates at which these chronic diseases occur. And, and our study uh, was with, uh, we ended up with 13 women. So it's a very small pilot study, uh, 13 women over six months. And we did have to provide all the food for them. Uh, and that was like almost a million dollars. So, so, so there just isn't enough money on the planet to do a long-term study. However, if you look at what we've been recommending in the West since the 1980s, since the first US dietary guidelines, which is this high carbohydrate diet, low fat diet, and you can just look at all the numbers, the, the increase in obesity, the increase in insulin resistance, the increase in inflammation, the increase in cardiovascular disease, increase in cancer, and, and a, it, anything that's related to those three factors uh, have all increased dramatically since, since we told people to start eating that high carb, low fat diet. So we could view that as an experiment on, you know, a billion people in the West tell everybody to eat a, a high carb, low fat diet and see what happens. So, so the results are here and people get old and they get obese and they get inflamed and they get insulin resistant and then they get chronic disease and then they have a decreased health span and they probably die early. So, so what we can do is take people that are sick, put them on a ketogenic diet and see the reversal of the markers we use to determine those like blood sugar levels, blood pressure levels, uh, lipid levels that the, um, you know, the blood lipid levels that, and, and liver enzymes and uh, uh, CRP, uh, we can look at lean mass versus fat mass and so on. So we can, the study we've done is very, very sophisticated using um, all the blood measures. We also do immunohistochemistry on the blood samples, which means we're looking at how the blood cells, the white cells are speaking to one another in terms of immune reactions because we're looking at cancer. Uh, and we've also used, it was the first clinical use ever of a digital PET scan, which is an imaging tool uh, that uses digital rather than analog images to, to look at uh, tumor size and tumor regression in the studies. So, so we threw everything that technology had to offer in this, this study that was released recently. It was in uh, PLOS One uh, last month um, in January, and uh, it's the first of a few papers. So, so, uh, so yes, I can tell you and I can tell your listeners that we have good, robust, scientific evidence that a ketogenic diet is the best diet for optimal health for most people. Now, about, about one out of eight people just don't respond well to a ketogenic diet. And then there's a very small percentage, which I, I mentioned in the first part too. Um, there's a number of like genetic um, metabolic conditions that are really rare that make it hard for them to metabolize ketones. So in those cases, the diet would be contraindicated. But but for seven out of eight people, you're probably going to be healthier and you're probably going to have much less li likely to uh, to to develop a chronic disease. Well, that's that's good news for a start, certainly for for healthy people at the moment. Let's talk again about those uh, patients, uh, the the ones that you were, were referring to in that paper you co-authored there recently, uh, the patients with uh, breast cancer. They were undergoing treatment for breast cancer. What were the findings of the impact of consuming that ketogenic diet as far as these patients were concerned? Did it confer upon them a, a boost, a boosted immune system, which would allow them then to to take on and to confront the, the illness that they were enduring at that moment in time? Or did it ha actually reduce uh, the uh, the size of tumors or, or whatever it was, uh, the, the metast what was it, metastatic uh, breast cancer? Me metastatic, yeah. Metastatic, yeah, so, that's it. Yeah. So, so our patients were um, terminal, uh, sadly. Uh, they had stage four uh, metastatic breast cancer, um, and they had undergone standard of treatment and, and were uh, basically there were no more, more options for them. Uh, so these are very ill women uh, and were very brave to engage in quite a significant lifestyle change to, to forward science. Um, so we worked with them for, for six months. Uh, three months, we provided the food for them, and we weighed it to a tenth of a gram. They came and picked it up every three days. We'd weigh things when it came back. So... Um, so the basic, so some of the findings, this is the first of several papers, some of the findings I can't speak to too much because it's the subject of somebody else's PhD thesis, it's the subject of some imaging people and I'm not an imaging agent, but 
I'll tell you what we found in this paper first, and then we can sort of extrapolate from that. Uh, you know, in anything in medicine, first do no harm. So the first thing we showed was even though these women were were quite ill, uh, there was no harm that came from the diet. So the so the the uh, you know going on cutting out carbohydrates and going on a ketogenic diet produced no harm. The second thing, which I think is really cool, but you have to think about it a bit, is the the metabolic changes, the improvement in body weight, the reduction in body fat, um, the reduction in blood sugar, the 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 increased insulin ses sensitivity, and so on. All of those changes, which were positive, were in the same range as you'd see for young, healthy athletes who we also work with from time to time. So, so the so the, the you're, you're getting the same metabolic response from women that are very ill and and taking, you know, they're taking chemotherapies and so on as a standard of care. Uh, but you're seeing the same positive changes in their metabolic health as you do in in young, healthy athletes. So that's probably the the best thing I can say. Um, it, we did get everybody into ketosis, um, and uh, we did reduce the blood sugar levels. We did increase insulin resistance significantly, like 30%. Uh, we reduced plasma insulin levels, which corresponds with the reduced uh, blood sugar levels. Um, we improved um, uh, the body composition, which is the ratio of, of fat to lean mass. And um, I can, I, just as an example, uh, when you lose weight, you always lose fat mass and lean mass. And the, the average weight loss in this study was about 10%. So it was, you know, these are mostly obese women. So it was typically 15 to 20 pounds they were losing. And, uh, um, and they lost three pounds of fat for every pound of lean mass. And that's exactly the same as we see in, in elite athletes that go on a ketogenic diet. That's, that's, that's a healthy ratio. If you look at something like, you know, Ozempic, that sort of thing, one of the problems with that is it actually reduces lean mass as much or more than the fat mass. So when you're an Ozempic and you lose weight, you're losing muscle and 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 other things. You're not losing fat at the same rate you would on on a on a healthy diet. So just by comparison, uh, that that was good. Now, some of the other studies we found, you mentioned the 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 immune system, and I don't like to I don't like to talk about a boosted immune system. And the reason I don't like to talk about that is, you know, uh, MS is a boosted immune system. Arthritis is a boosted. <laughs> it's when your immune system is so active, it starts attacking your own body. I like to talk about optimized. And so what we've seen, we measured about a dozen different, uh, they're called uh, cytokines and ketokines. Uh, they have like interleukins, interferons, colony stimulating factor. These are the, the, the chemical signals that your immune system cells use to speak to one another to alert one another to what's going on and what they need to address. And indeed we did see, and it was a subject of another paper, we did see uh, positive changes in, um, I think we had about three or four uh, of those dozen, which were all, could all be considered anti-cancer, um, uh, positive anti-cancer changes uh, in, in that, because um, cancer is an inflammatory disease too. So. Uh, lower inflammation, but activation of of um, the right kinds of white cells that would identify and destroy cancer cells. We did see that activity. Now, because it's such a small sample size, it's really hard to say conclusively, you know, we proved that, but we did see those changes. And then with the imaging we've done, um, I only have access to some of the images that, that belongs to the, it was quite a large team. Uh, by the way, the team is uh, at, at um, we're here in Vancouver at the British Columbia Cancer Research Center. That's where we do our research on the immunohistochemistry. The team and the patients are all at uh, the Ohio State University uh, with Jeff Bullock's team there. Um, uh, and so they, the imaging team is all there too. And and we did see complete uh, remission of uh, we call them hypermetastases of the tumor growth. So usually with breast cancer. I think all of these women had had double mastectomy, uh, double double radical mastectomy. But the cancer, when it spreads, it tends to go well in the bones, but in the in the liver, lungs, and brain, uh, and sometimes in that order. It's because of the nature of those organs; they kind of have blood vessels that get smaller as they go into them, and they they can trap um, trap uh, um, rogue cells. So so uh, most of the women in the study they had hypermetastases in the liver. You could see them at the start of the trial. And then uh, after three weeks, uh, six weeks, uh, and up to six months, we could see in some of them complete remission of those tumors, and in others a regression of the tumors. But again, that's that's anecdotal because the sample size was so small, 
and we were using PET CT. So um, the interesting thing about that uh, positron emission tomography, it's called, is that the imaging agent we use is actually glucose, which is blood sugar. And we put a radioactive fluorine, so it's called fluorideoxy glucose. And and the reason we can use that to to image cancer is cancer cells love sugar because they can't metabolize fats and proteins. So so they'll concentrate sugar like 100 to 200 times, which kind of tells you if you're on a high carbohydrate diet, then you're kind of feeding a lot of fuel that cancer cells want. And when you're on a high carbohydrate diet, your insulin levels are high. And insulin, we know, is is very powerful in, in, in pulling sugar out of the blood into the especially muscle and fat cells. But insulin is also a very powerful growth factor. So, so if you think of your cancer cells, they're kind of like plants in your garden. What you're doing on a high carbohydrate diet is you're providing all of the all of the sunlight, uh, which they use to produce uh, macromolecules, and then all of the fertilizer, which would be the insulin, that they can stand on a high carb diet. And so, no surprise, you get rapid growth of tumors. So our, the, the basic really, really, and this is way oversimplified, Matthew, but the basic principle of the ketogenic diet is you you reduce the um, carbohydrate load and, and you, you don't, it doesn't go to zero. You still have the proper level, but the carbohydrate is produced from non-carbohydrate sources in your liver and, and again in your kidneys. And that and that's called uh, gluconeogenesis, literally making new glucose. And that's what, you know, dogs and cats and other carnivores do and, and the like. So so carnivore diet, by the way, would be a ketogenic diet, um, unless you're eating tons of liver. Um, uh, so so um, anyway, by, by, by limiting the sugar levels to moderate it at its natural level, you also moderate the insulin levels. So now you're kind of tuning out the sun a little bit and you're decreasing the amount of fertilizer. And then that sort of tips things in favor of your immune system. So, so the, the here's a question for you, and, and feel free to just say I don't know. But how many times during your lifetime do you think you actually produce like metastatic cancer cells, like cells that would become threatening tumors? I, I would think like I would think you're probably doing it all the time, to be honest. Exactly right, two or three times a day. So, so two or three times a day, and your immune system finds them and destroys them before they grow. So there's this constant arms race between your immune system and the cancer cells growing. And as we get older, our immune systems become a little bit less efficient. And then if we're pouring all this carbohydrate on it and boosting insulin levels and boosting sugar levels, you're, you're giving an advantage to the cancer cells, and your immune system just can't keep up. So, so that's one of the reasons, in a very simplified way, that as we get older, we tend to see more tumor, tumor growth in, in, in older adults. A couple of moments ago, you mentioned body composition and you also mentioned the term inflammation. Last week, I interviewed a doctor who was uh, talking passionately about visceral fat in the body and, the, and the, the dangers that accumulation of visceral fat around our organs can cause, especially when it comes to sending signals, uh, inflammatory signals around the body to other parts of the body. And that can contribute then to metabolic disease. Uh, what are your thoughts on visceral fat then? And is visceral fat also affected whenever you ascribe to this ketogenic diet? Uh, yeah, well, the ketogenic diet is very good at reducing visceral fat because what you do is you turn off sugar burning and you turn on fat burning. And so you go to those stores. So so just so everybody uh, watching or listening understands, there, there's, there's subcutaneous fat and there's visceral fat. So the subcutaneous fat, you know, is under your skin. It doesn't correlate with, with bad health outcomes. Uh, and often in women, they put on subcutaneous fat around their buttocks and so on. It's, it's, it's the visceral fat that's inside. So you can be, we call it Sophie. You can be skinny outside, fat inside. You can have lots of visceral fat. So it's the visceral fat is the stuff around your organs, not the stuff between your muscle wall and, 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 and your skin. Um, and, and, uh, and that fat, half of the cells in there, so, th so the fat cells are called adipose. And half of the cells mixed in with that adipose are macrophages. And the macrophages can kind of switch to be good or bad. And when they're in fat tissue, they tend to secrete a lot of signals that create systemic inflammation. So, so inflammation in the short term for wound healing is a good thing, but chronic inflammation is a bad thing. And it will aggravate cancer and cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Alzheimer's is effectively inflammation of the brain. Um, but that is what causes cardiovascular disease because the, the, the inflammation causes the damage to the endothelium of the blood vessels, and then you get the atherosclerotic plaques forming and so on. Uh, but that's not due to fat in your diet, that's due to inflammation, which is due to sugar in your diet. <laughs> 
Yeah. Can we talk again then about insulin resistance? You mentioned that also a couple of moments ago. Can we define again exactly what that means? Because I don't think people fully appreciate the gravity of uh, insulin sensitivity and insulin insulin resistance. And then what ramifications that then has then for uh, chronic inflammation and then for metabolic disease? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so insulin is a very powerful hormone. It's one of the most powerful hormones we have. We secrete it in very, it's actually a Canadian discovery. Insulin was discovered by, uh, you know, Banting, Best, Collip, and, and McLeod in Canada, University of Toronto in the early part of the last century. Um, and uh, one of the great medical discoveries was insulin. And, and so it's used as a therapeutic for people that can't produce their own, that have type one diabetes, that, that they, they've lost the cells that produce the insulin. And then there's type 2 diabetes, which is 90% of it. And in those people, they that is a result of insulin resistance. So, so you kind of the best analogy I can think of is um, you might have some older relatives who are going deaf. And you visit your their house, you know, and they have the radio or the TV, and it's turned up so loud. And it's loud because they're going deaf, so they can't hear it. So they can only hear if they turn the sound up more. And what that does, of course, is make them even more deaf. So then they turn the sound up more and they get more deaf and, you know, eventually you don't hear anymore. It's the same kind of thing with insulin. So insulin has receptors on cells throughout your body uh, and, and it has different effects on those receptors. But primarily we think of its effects on adipose tissue, fat tissue and muscle where it, where it pulls uh, sugar out of the blood. And so, you know, the cell has a receptor for the insulin. Now, if there's too much insulin then the cells will downregulate those receptors. In other words, they produce fewer of them because we're going, we don't want to over-respond to the insulin. That would suck too much sugar out of the blood. Our blood sugar would drop, we'd pass out, we could die from hypoglycemia. So the cells go, okay, there's way too much insulin in the system all the time. So we'll just produce less receptors. And those receptors then have less of a response when they need to respond. So the body goes, oh, uh, I thought we had enough insulin in there, but the cells aren't responding properly. Let's just put more insulin in the system. So what happens is your insulin secretions go up and up and up, and your ability of your cells to respond to that go down and down and down, like that elderly person going deaf by turning the TV up too much. So that's insulin resistance, and it occurs over a period of decade, uh, a decade or more. Um, and uh, and so what that does when you become insulin resistant is your blood sugar starts rising. Now, from a medical perspective, you know, once your blood sugar passes like seven is the number we use here, um, then they say, okay, now you're diabetic. And, you know, they usually do a, like a hemoglobin A1C or a two-hour glucose tolerance test, something like that. Uh, and they'll say, if it's above that, you're, you're, you're now insulin resistant. Your body's not responding to insulin. And so they'll do things to bring that blood sugar back down. So metformin, uh, later stages insulin. But of course, if you have a glucose tolerance issue because you've been secreting too much insulin and now you're injecting insulin to get even more of it in your system to keep your blood sugar down, you can see that doesn't end well. And 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 so we're not really treating the root cause of diabetes uh, through adding more insulin to the system be because the root cause is at the metabolic level is there's just too much, you're eating too much sugar. And, and ironically, Matthew, up until like a couple of years ago, now things have changed. The recommendation for diabetics was a high carbohydrate diet. These are people that have a defined glucose intolerance and you're feeding them, like that's what all carbohydrates are, they turn into glucose. You're feeding them so much glucose, it just, it, it's literally like throwing gasoline on a fire to try and put it out. That's just, that just doesn't work well. So, so that, and, and, and once you, once you get that, the high sugar levels also cause inflammation throughout the system they cause the creation of called advanced glycate identities, which are highly inflammatory. The sugar itself can cause microangiopathy. So, you know, circulation of your toes and your eyes and things uh, um, get worse. You can have amputations. You could go blind. All of these things are late stage uh, diabetes. None of them, for the most part, have to happen. There's very little type 2 diabetes 100 years ago because people didn't eat that much carbohydrate. They were eating more animal-based products. They weren't eating processed food. They weren't drinking high sugar drinks. Uh, they were eating like real food. So so that's, I mean, if there's any take home message, it would be, you know, get sugar out of your diet for starters. Um, I would say get uh, seed oils out because they're highly inflammatory. So, you know, just grass fed butter. I buy Kerrygold butter, which comes from Ireland. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> you know, right true, here. true. Beautiful, 
beautiful grass fed butter. I drink like this is tea with full full fat whipping cream in it. Um, you know, enjoy that stuff. Uh, and, 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 and don't eat any of that processed food. So you can get rid of processed food, get rid of sugar and, and just stick to good fats like olive oil and grass fed butter and things like that. Then, then you, you're going to, you're going to have a massive positive impact on your, on your health. Well, I'm glad you brought up exactly what you consume because you ascribe to this diet yourself, this ketogenic diet. So could you just give myself and the listeners and the viewers just a, a, an inkling of what your average day and your food consumption looks like so as they can get a sense of, of how, you, how you feed yourself on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so so I because I've been doing this for more than a decade, I've, I've come around, you know, I use like uh, nut uh, flours to make some things like muffins and and you know coconut flour. I use uh, soy flour. I use a lot of eggs, a lot of cream, a lot of you know uh, dairy, uh, high fat dairy. So high fat yogurt, high fat Greek yogurt that's unsweetened. Um, I eat about a handful of berries every day. Uh, I like the fiber. I like the phytochemicals that are there. So blackberries, blueberries, strawberries. Generally, if things taste sweet, they're probably not that good for you. So people think, well. Fruit's good for you, right? And I go, well, we've designed fruit to be so sweet, like the apples we eat now are so sweet. And that sweetness is carbohydrate. And so it's a lot of carbohydrate for your system, even if it does come with some soluble fiber. So if you looked at my dinner, um, uh, so uh, tonight we're going to have some salmon. I'll eat with the skin. You know, if I eat chicken, I eat the chicken skin, that sort of thing. Uh, we eat vegetables, vegetables that grow above the ground that aren't beans or grains. We don't eat root vegetables because they're high in starch. So, uh, you know, peppers and, and green beans and uh, lettuces and uh, avocados, tomatoes. Uh, a lot of what we call vegetables are actually fruits anyway, but we call them vegetables. If it's got a seed in it, it's probably fruits. Um, but no, no root vegetables. Uh, and then no pasta, rice, potatoes, beans, none of that stuff. Um, and uh, it's very satisfying. Um, one of the things that I that uh, I, I like to eat about people say, well, you're eating all that fat, um, uh, you know, are, are you eating a lot of calories? And and so it's an interesting thing to think about. And and uh, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but a calorie is not a measurement of weight. A calorie is a measurement of heat energy. So so you know, you take one cc of water and raise it one degree. That's the energy in a calorie. So when we talk about oh, you're getting all your calories. Well. If you what makes you put on weight, if you're concerned with weight, and, and frankly, 90 plus percent of people that come to ketogenic diets, it's because it's the very effective way to lose and keep off weight as long as you stay on it. Um, they say, well, you know, like what you want to do is eat less mass because it's the mass that adds to your body, the non water mass, because water can just kind of flow through us. But so, uh, fats have twice more than twice the density, caloric density that carbohydrates and proteins have. So if you actually want to get your 2000 calories a day that you need and eat the least amount of mass, you'd want to eat the most dense food, which would be high fat foods. Uh, not, you know, the the foods that you have to eat so much of. Like, I, 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 people ask, can you be vegan on a ketogenic diet? Sure, it's you, you probably need a degree in nutrition to make sure you got all the nutrients and so on. Uh, you can do it, um, but, um, uh, what we need to do is, is, is help people understand that that whole calorie model, calories in and calories out, we're not bomb calorimeters, we're not closed systems. Just discard that. The, it, it doesn't help us because then people start thinking, well, I can outrun my diet. If I eat a crappy diet, I'll just go for a longer run. I know you're very active. I was looking at your, your website and stuff. I know you're a very active athlete. I'll just run more. I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll eat chocolate cake and whatever, and then I'll go and run a 10K run or something like that. You can't outrun your fourth. If you're eating a crappy diet, it's going to have bad effects on you no matter how much you exercise. Now, exercise is a fantastic thing, but it's not going to make up for a crappy diet. So so we call it the the carbohydrate hormone model, which which is about insulin. We've been talking about insulin resistance and reducing carbohydrate. And that's the model that is that is uh, just consistently producing the kinds of positive results we want to see when we when we do it in a clinical uh, a clinical setting. And it's uh, you know I just thank you for having a show like this and for inviting me on because it, it allows me to speak directly to the public because as you know in the health and fitness world there's just so much gunk on the internet. <laughs> So uh, somehow I just want to like clear the deck and say, no, this is not, none of this is right. You need to actually listen to the science and, but people don't know where to go to see the science. 
because so much of it is polluted by you know, uh, vested interests like processed food companies that pay people to do research to say, oh, Coca-Cola Coca -Cola is a good thing to drink. Yeah, it's very healthy in a balanced diet. And it's kind of like, no, there's nothing really healthy about Coca-Cola. I mean, it won't kill you, but if you drink enough of it, it probably will. <laughs> well, we'll come to food politics in a minute because I want to talk to you about that. But uh, you mentioned uh, science there and uh, you refer to the scientific method in the book. Talk to me about the yeah. significance of underscoring that scientific method uh, in the context of what you just mentioned a moment ago about there being so much bad information and bad advice out there. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, and a lot of it is it, it does go back to politics because you'll see oh, a report out of the, you know, the, the Chan School of Public Health in Harvard University. And we go, oh, Harvard, you know, uh, I went to Cambridge. So I started thinking of Harvard. That's that little backwater school in the United States. But but, you know, that's got a lot of cachet to it. So you automatically think if it's from Harvard, it must be right. But no, nah, I wouldn't say so. A lot of the stuff that comes out of there is their retrospective um, um, sort of uh, macro analysis of prior studies. And especially during COVID, what happened was people couldn't do research during COVID. So what they do is they go, well, we have all these other studies that were done in the past and we'll just, we'll put them all together and we'll run some statistics on them and we'll see if we can find correlations between lifestyle and disease and lifestyle being diet. Correlation is not causation. So anytime they say, oh, we found people that ate too much of this, you know, they got more of that disease and they go, well, show me the mechanism. I've done this all over the world when I talk to physicians or scientists or whatever, show me the mechanism by which saturated fat, which is the cleanest burning fuel you can put in your body, um, causes heart disease because it's just carbon and hydrogen. There's, and, and that's, that's basically as clean burning a fuel as you can get. Um, so why would, and nobody has an answer for that because, because all of the results are from these correlational studies and they're retrospective in that I would ask you, Matthew, so in the last year, um, how many slices of bread would you say you ate per day, you know, or how many times would you eat an apple or, or how many, um, how, what, how many servings of liver would you have? You know, what's a serving size? And people are just terrible at remembering what they've eaten. I can't remember what I ate two days ago, you know, but but they're terrible at, and they're terrible at portion sizes and they're terrible at admitting to eating way too much of foods they know aren't good for them. So all those cookies and treats, they just don't. Oh, yeah, I had a chocolate. Oh, I forgot about the chocolate bar. You know, I forgot about the four cookies I had after dinner or whatever or the three pints of, you know, Guinness, which is good for you. Um, and and uh, so. Um, so so a retrospective study, it's just not science to start with. It's not good data. And then to combine that with other crappy studies that don't show causation, they just show correlation, combine them all together and do this meta analysis of all this stuff and come up with a conclusion. To me, if you're starting with crap, combining it together and stirring it up, just it's still crap. So so the only way to really do this is to actually do the kinds of studies we did, which is to have, you know, what they call randomized controlled trials. So people are randomized into one group or another, and you control all the variables you can on one side and all the variables you can uh, on the other, and you have a, a control group you compare to, and then you let it run, and then you see the changes. But the changes you have have to be statistically significant. So there is still some numerical uh, uh, value to that, which means sample sizes need to be large enough and so on. And you're obliged to then at least suggest what the mechanism would be. So, so just going out there and saying, oh, people that ate more of this had more diabetes. No, yeah, but you need to tell me how that happens because from a scientific perspective, we need to know the mechanism. Then we can look at potential treatment regimens and so on that would be effective. So I would say 90 plus percent of nutrition science is garbage and not worth your time. And really look for the best people in the best institutions that are, that are using high level uh, science in controlled studies. And, and uh, often, frankly, those have to be done on animals and then we extrapolate to people because it's, you know, making people eat food is kind of an ethical issue or making them not eat food. So, so we use a lot of animal models to start with and then we can at least determine the mechanism and then we can see if that mechanism is active uh, for humans, which, which uh, always is a, a bit of a stretch. But but really demonstrating uh, the benefits or, or, or detriments of particular diets in humans is very, very challenging to do and very expensive to do. 
See, this is the conundrum that somebody like myself has because uh, a part of my mission really is to try to present science to people and research to people in order that they uh, can educate themselves and make informed decisions on their own health and improve themselves ultimately and acquire those positive and happy habits uh, that are in the title of this podcast. But it's very, very difficult whenever there's so much information coming out uh, constantly. And as you said, most of the information and most of that research, even if it comes from rep- Um, 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 colleges or universities around the world like Harvard isn't necessarily of a good quality because the study hasn't been done to a high enough standard as you alluded to there so how can people listening to this make better and informed decisions such that they can arrive at the the correct conclusion for them that whatever their information they're consuming is is right and will it will benefit them from a health perspective going forward um well i guess that's partly why i wrote my book bio diet was to help people have a source that's scientifically valid and and clinically proven and um and i you know i have a website they can go to and send me an email and i'll answer their emails i do that so uh um you kind of in this day and age have to go right to the source so uh i actually think that it's people like you that are giving us the venue to speak directly to the public about what's true and what's not Uh, we could do a whole other show on the politics of food because it's really interesting um, and by the way, the same people are involved that were involved with the cigarette business, you know, so. Uh, oh, you're preempting uh, my questions now, because I was yeah, just yeah. I was just about to ask you about that, because um, yeah. I, inter- I interviewed Professor Marian Nessel there a few months ago, who wrote the yeah. book Food Politics. Brilliant woman. And she's been at the forefront of fighting uh, food companies mm-hmm. for the last 50, 60 years. And she alluded to that fact that food companies are now replicating uh, the strategies that the tobacco companies would have taken back in the 50s, 60s and 70s in order to push yeah. their products on people. Can we can we just briefly talk about food politics in that sense? Because I, I know it was the food companies that put it into people's minds that sold people the message that fat was bad and that sugar was good. Can you talk to me from your perspective about that? Um, I don't think we have time for the long story, uh, <laughs> but 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 the short story. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I think we knew that sugar was bad for us from way before, but there's a fellow named Ansel Keys that came about in the 1960s that he was the one that demonized saturated fat and cholesterol and had whole, this whole heart diet hypothesis. So in science, a hypothesis is the idea that you then test using hopefully randomized controlled trials to determine the truth of the matter. Um, And and Keyes himself was guilty of some of the worst um, transgressions of good science. Uh, The famous seven countries study he did that showed the correlation of heart disease and high fat diets. It was actually a 21 country study. And he just threw out all the countries that didn't fit his model. So (laughs) that's like the worst science. Keyes actually did um, uh, with with Hegler, um, Mark Hegler was the guy who came up with the first dietary uh, guidelines for the U.S. effectively. Uh, and they did a study in Minnesota where they actually uh, looked at uh, uh, shut-ins. They were prisoners and they fed them uh, a, a, a polyunsaturated fat diet and a saturated fat diet. And they looked at different, you know, over a long period of time. So it was literally a controlled trial because these people were in a prison and they were only given the food that they could eat. Um and interestingly, the the result was there was no result. There was no no they they set out to show that saturated fat caused heart disease, and it was a wash. Like every other study of that sort has been a wash, because uh, there's no relation there, because there's no mechanism by which that would happen. But they didn't publish that. They it was an expensive study. They spent a lot of money on it, and finally the the government, who somebody one of the bureaucrats said, well listen, we gave you all this money, you never published anything from this, and they didn't want to publish it because it disagreed with what they thought. And, and that's terrible science as well. I mean, you should abandon the model that you hold to be true in the face of new evidence to the contrary and adopt a new model, which is what I had to do in my life So with, with nutrition. So they did eventually publish it in this obscure, I think it was Dutch journal in Dutch. So it effectively, almost nobody would read it. And, and they go, there, we published it. So, uh, so the other thing is that the food industry uh, you know, real estate is the most valuable asset on the planet. Um, and then maybe oil, but trans in a transactional sense, on a daily basis, everybody eats and we all buy food. So I think it's something like $7 trillion a year we spend on food. And about 3 to $4 trillion of that is highly processed food. 
And those foods are produced by about 12 huge multinational companies like General Foods and Nabisco and Nestle and so on and so forth. And, and all of the different products that you think are all these, they're all produced by, well, I shouldn't say all, but almost all of them are produced by these 12 companies. So the money involved in continuing to have people eat their food is enormous. And they don't, honestly, they don't seem to care if people, if it's making people sick or not. So I had the deputy minister, I was at a conference, deputy minister of health in Canada, up on, on stage at a, at a, a large conference. And I, I asked him, I said, as a nutrition scientist, I said, why are you allowing uh, processed food companies to advertise poison to children? And he, he didn't know what to say because they do, you know, our, our policymakers allow those things to be done and they are, they're, they're legal products. You can sell, uh, you know, sh sugar always was the devil, but when Keyes and his friends came along, they pushed all the sugar people out. And by the way, Mark Hegler, it turns out, uh, there's a woman at UC San Francisco that discovered he was paid uh, the equivalent today of about two or three hundred thousand dollars laid on his career to not demonize sugar, but to demonize fat. And it came from the sugar lobby in the United States. So they literally paid this guy from Harvard paid this guy to say, no, it's not sugar, it's fat. You should stop eating. And, and that's what we've been stuck with for 30, 40 years now. And it and it's making people sick and it's killing people early. And somehow that that meme is so transfixed in people's minds. You know, you think of people eating like animal meat or just, you know, carnivore diet or whatever. Oh, that all that saturated fat, you're gonna have a heart attack. No, no, actually it's pretty darn good for you. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I'm not a carnivore myself, but I think um, we have done some limited studies to see if there's any uh, adverse effects from people. In, in, uh, and I think it was David Diamond did this down in uh, University of South Florida. Nothing for carnivores. Like they're not dropping dead of heart attacks like you'd expect. So uh, and, and when it kind of makes sense that, you know, that's kind of Inuit people, that's kind of what they were eating is a, is a full animal diet. And they seem to be pretty healthy on that. So I'm not surprised that we didn't find that. But I just I just prefer to have more, you know, a little bit of fruit, not very much um, vegetables and things in my diet. But but I also like to eat, you know, here they're called chicharrones. They're basically it's uh, it's the skin of the of the pig with the with the meat in it. And then they they deep fry it in lard, which is pig fat. And to me, that's health food. Well, ex excuse the pun. Certainly, an awful lot of food for thought there, and uh, Thank you. I, I know you. I know you detail uh, those uh, dietary recommendations in your own book. The book again is called Bio Diet, and uh, Dr. David Harper. Can you give us your website and a way for people to find out more about uh, the work that you do? Sure. Um, uh, well, I'm at the University of the Fraser Valley. I'm in the Department of Kinesiology. Uh, you can find me there. This is it's in just uh, about 75 kilometers east of where I am in Vancouver. Um, that's my university. I work at the BC Cancer Research Center, as I mentioned, and also in collaboration with Dr. Jeff Volok at Ohio State University. Uh, the book, BioDiet, all one word, and it's the site is biodiet.org. Uh, and uh, my wife helped me write it to get the. She's a journalist like you, and helped get the tone right for the general audience. So. Um, you know, it started off at about a thousand pages and it's now about 200 pages. So the, so the first half is why it all works, explaining the science. The second half is how to do it safely. Um, and, and, and so they can go to biodiet.org. You can order it through there. We, we actually did our, our audio version. My wife and I read the book ourselves. We trade back and forth. If you like audio books, uh, it's available as an ebook, uh, and, and it's available in hardcover anywhere. I mean, it sells all over the world. So you know, any I, I don't want to mention any names, but any of those online retailers will will be able to provide it. Uh, and I, I try to keep the cost down as low as possible. So in Canada, it's 20 bucks. So I don't know what that is in Ireland. Uh, maybe, I don't know, 10 pounds less than that. It's not in the audiobooks half that price. I think the ebooks about like five pounds, something like that. So it's the uh, it's probably about the price of a pint of Guinness. You can get all the <laughs> nutritional information you need. <laughs> well, let's by the you way, when we we tested Guinness in the lab. It didn't seem to reduce uh, ketosis too much. So if I do have the odd ale, because I drink mostly wine, I don't drink. I used to drink a lot of beer. 
Um, I don't know if it's high carb, but Guinness seems to seems to have somehow slid under the carpet there. I don't know how, but it's a, I, I, it's a magical drink. So I'll have to approach Guinness and see if I can get some sponsorship. So for the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Harper, I will pop a link uh, to your website and uh, you. to your book also in the show notes for this episode. But for the moment, thank you so much. A really interesting conversation. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much for the opportunity and uh, any time. Well, thank you for listening or watching this episode of the Happy Habit podcast. If you enjoyed it or indeed any of the previous 380 plus episodes, well then show your support because it'll cost you nothing. Like, subscribe, share and do leave the podcast a positive rating. Until next time, stay happy.